that skill is to make measurements, physics measurements of wildland fire. And uh, I also like a meager and unsatisfactory kind. A lot of subjective measurements are, to me, meager and unsatisfactory, un irreproducible. And uh, a lot of fire literature is, is filled with that type of uh, data. So uh, like I said in my little bio there, I consider myself an instrumentation physicist, also an electronic engineer, although I have no training in that. Uh, and our fire research at Rochester Institute of Technology started with a federal appropriation from, and I'll use these words in the same sentence, environmentally minded Republican congressman uh, who since quit. Uh, he couldn't take the current administration. We deployed some physics-based fire measurement in instruments with the Rocky Mountain Research Station out on the Coney Ridge complex in 2003. And we measure fire radiated power in fire winds during a burnout operation on a wildfire. And we learned that how difficult it was to operate in a large suppression operation. During that time period, we, we spent a whole bunch of time out in the Missoula Fire Lab, worked with uh, Don Latham to start with, who's uh, since retired from there. And we discovered some subtle radiative features of wildland fire, namely emission from molecular bands and a very strong atomic line emission, which was unknown previous to uh, actually using spectroscopic instruments on wildland fires. And over the years, I hope we figured out what to measure to satisfy Lord Kelvin's idea of having numbers to uh, actually have real data. So as an analog for what I'm going to talk about, I refer to astrophysics. Astrophysics, to me, is uh, in, within physics one of the, the most incredibly beautiful expressions of human intelligence. And, and astrophysicists get their data from one source, from radiant emissions from the objects they look at. Only electromagnetic radiation propagates to great distances through space, relatively unchanged. And through laboratory work on, on the surface of the Earth, the electromagnetic emission and absorption processes are some of the best understood ideas of physics. So these can be applied at great distances or to look at all sorts of different observation, observational uh, situations like wildland fire. But you really, there's only a few things you can measure from radiant emissions. You can measure the energy release rate, the power, the power density. You can measure the time history of the energy release rate. You can look at the spectra. And you can measure the total energy by integrating the energy release rate over time. So from those four things, astrophysicists have derived an understanding of the universe that is quite incredible. So I think from even from the S-130, 190 classes, we all know that thermal energy is transferred by conduction, convection, and radiation. So uh, that's actually a picture from the 2003 fire. <laughs> uh, radiation convection hit an object uh, as forms of energy transport. And here we have a target tree bowl. That, and then at that point, conduction is a dominant energy transport mechanism, and the, and the tree bowl heats up by conduction through the bark and cambium and all the rest of the layers of the tree. This picture will show up a little bit later, uh, as will some of the other slides here. So I argue that the radiant energy release is the best way, and I might say I almost believe it's the only way to measure a wildland fire. The energy release from a wildland fire is primarily through convection. About 80 percent of the energy comes off as hot, hot air through convection, while 20 percent is radiation. Convection and mass flow in general is very, very difficult to measure except at a point. And it's just the nature of flow detectors. It's really, really difficult to measure the flow at anything else than a, a single point. Well, a fire is not a single point. And what does the point that you're measuring have to do with the rest of the fire? It's really difficult to know. If the first bullet is true on this slide, and the relationship between convection and radiation is relatively constant, then we only really need to measure radiation. And that can be done easily at multiple scales. For example, you can have a very fine scale instrument that measures uh, a centimeter size location within a fire, or you could use a satellite to cover a kilometer square. And 
the radiation flux and energy from wildland fire is proportional to the total energy release, which directly affects fire behavior and fire effects. Therefore, I'd argue that you only need to measure radiative power and energy, along with some, I've got, got to add, yet to be developed models that link fire effects, fire behavior with radiated energy. So I have some facts here, and I'll show you uh, some mild proof of these facts as we move along. There's a relationship between fuel consumption and the radiant energy release. I think this is pretty straightforward. I'm not saying the relationship is constant, but there is a relationship. If you burn more fuel, you get more energy out. That's pretty straightforward. There's a relationship between convective and radiant energy release. We call that the fire radiative fraction. In the literature, it's referred to that. And there's a fixed, but widely, it might be widely variable relationship too, and uh, some of my collaborators have studied this, moist fuels, wet fuels versus dry fuels. The re relation between convective and radiant energy release changes, but it is relatively constant for a particular fuel type. The spectra of radiant emissions from a wildfire are much more complex than has been assumed. Previously, the fire has been looked at, or the flame has been looked at as a black body radiator and the heat from the fire comes from emission, radiant emission from heated soot particles in the so-called flame bag, which is the interior of the flame. But we have consequences for measurement of the total energy, because if we only measure a specific wavelength, we're missing, we might be missing some of the energy that the fire has emitted. And especially for remotely sensed measurement of radiative energy, where particular bands are used, and I'll show that in a few slides, you might be missing a lot of energy that the fire is generating. Measuring radiant emissions alone, we should be able to infer fire effects on organisms. And that's because of, of the relationship between uh, 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 bullet two, there's a relationship between convective and radiant energy, or basically radiant and total energy release. And uh, my degree in environmental studies from relatively recently uh, was in toxicology-based environmental studies, and the, the nature of the dose response was driven home to me, and I, I brought this up in conversations with my collaborators, and uh, at least one, Alistair Smith out in the University of Idaho, is actually doing dose response measurements based on measurement of radiant energy uh, produced by a test fire. So let's, for example, look at seedling mortality. Heat is released from the fire during combustion, transported to the target through the atmosphere. There's some absorption that takes place there. It's absorbed by the target, and there's uh, modeling that needs to be done there, and then transported to the tissues by conduction, which produces an effect based on the time temperature history of those tissues. This is a classic toxicological problem where transport and absorption, uh, if you, if, you know, a, a drug use has all the same uh, drug effect on a human or a test subject has the same, same uh, components as this uh, little diagram here. So since the heat release from the fire is proportional to the radiant energy and everything else along the, the pathway of a transport, absorption, and then conduction, is proportional to that radiant energy, we should be able to just measure the radiant energy and produce a dose response relationship for mortality of, for example, tree seedlings. And this is from a paper uh, by Alistair Smith uh, from 2016 where they looked at the change in the green, greenness, NDVI basically, of a, of a, a bunch of uh, seedlings exposed to different levels of total fire energy. And it looks like there's a, a fair proportionality, at least for the number of samples that were done here. So to complete our model of trying to understand fire through a radiant energy release alone, we have to do a lot, a lot more fundamental measurements than we're doing now. The first thing is energy partition relationships must be established. There is the ratio of convective to radiative flux, which we call 
radiant energy fraction or radiative energy fraction. And that's been measured for a, a, a certain class of experiments, but certainly has not been measured at large scales. And certainly it's d difficult to measure uh, on, on large fires. And that, that needs to be measured to understand the relationship between radiated energy and total energy liberated by the fire. The basic thermophysical properties of wildland fuel must also be measured. This means uh, heat capacity, conduction, heat conduction, all the basic mechanical engineering uh, or physics, thermophysical properties. And that's to understand once energy is absorbed by an organism, how does it propagate within that organism and what effects does it have, does that energy have uh, within the organism? We need to look much more in depth at the spectra from wildland fires. We, we've looked a little bit with the limited resources we have, and we've been quite surprised to find some really shocking things about a wildland fire that, that says that uh, wildland fire fuels generate spectra that are definitely not just black body spectra. And so uh, repeating what I said down there, the assumptions about the black body nature must need to be checked and especially for satellite remote sensors who might be missing significant portions of the energy liberated by the fire by their particular choice of uh, observe, uh, observing bands on their satellites. So let's go back to this list again where I'm trying to convince you that you only need to measure radiated energy. So there's a relationship between fuel consumption and radiant energy release. It's generally proportional. So this is a a picture from back in the day, I, I noticed Matt Dickinson is on here. Uh, we did some open burning experiments on sort of a 10 meter scale. And in the center of that plot is a infrared radiometer looking down at the center of the, of the fuel mass that's burning there. And the fuel was distributed evenly in this plot. We sampled the center of the plot to avoid edge effect and what we discovered was that there was a relationship between the fuel consumption and the energy that was radiated by the fire. We also show on the same plot uh, some data obtained by Martin Wooster for similar but much smaller experiments. His experiments are about a meter squared in grass fuels. And this is uh, oak litter. And here we have some supplementary uh, wood to increase the fuel loading. So we pretty much have a linear relationship between fuel consumption and radiation, but the slope of that relationship might be different depending on a number of things. Uh, and again, one of my collaborators, Alistair Smith out in the University of Idaho has measured this, has performed this at, for different fuel moistures and get, has gotten slightly different slopes. It doesn't mean that there's no relationship between measured and derived uh, from uh, convective and radiative energy. Let me start that again. It doesn't mean that there's no relationship between uh, radiated and convective energy from a fire. It just means we don't know the, the boundaries of what the upper and lower limits are of how much energy comes off as convection and how much energy comes off as radiated energy. Okay, so here I'm saying the same thing. There's a relationship between convective and radiant energy. Here's another experiment which we published few years ago, uh, which shows that if you assume is 20% of the total comes off as radiation, so the free, the free variable here was the radiant energy. We measured the total, the, what the percentage of radiant energy. We knew how much fuel was burned. We knew the heat of combustion of the fuel, which is how much fuel energy is liberated per unit mass of fuel burned. And it turns out we got about five megajoules per meter squared of, of uh, energy, which implies a radiant fraction of about 20%. And again, that radiant fraction changes, and we need to know the limits on that, but it's generally about 20% from all the literature that I've uh, been able to find. This is a big surprise for us. When we first started looking at, at fire uh, at RIT here, I'm in a group that is largely uh, reflectance, remote sensing folks. 
and we had some instruments that measure uh, spectra from various uh, sources uh, up to about two and a half microns. So we, we started looking at fires with instruments that had spectral ranges from the ultraviolet to sort of the uh, mid-infrared, about two and a half microns. And we, we, we came up with a number of surprises. The first one was that there's a very strong line emission, and this is uh, Don Latham at the, at the Forest Service uh, Rocky Mountain Research Station. He took this data first, uh, and he, he found out that there's a very strong line emission from potassium from wildland fire fuels. And this only comes from flaming combustion, and it's just to the uh, long wavelength side of an oxygen absorption line, so it does make it through the atmosphere. And the paper that was uh, published in Journal of Remote Sensing, we showed some AVERS data. AVERS is a satellite. Uh, AVERS data that uh, where you could actually see the flaming fronts very, very clearly, uh, and basically no background at all. We also discovered that emission from the fire produced heated water vapor, carbon monoxide, and carbon dioxide. And these strong emission lines in the one to five micron band, that should be micrometer band, produces an extra signal which, is, uh, which can result in, in errors in how you measure or what you, what you think is the energy radiated by a fire. But it's also energy that, because of the absorption of these emission lines within the atmosphere, that satellite remote sensors will never see. So again, carbon dioxide and water vapor are strongly absorbed. The, the emission lines from those uh, materials are strongly absorbed in the atmosphere. So satellites purposely don't look in those wave bands, and that light will be absorbed and never seen by the satellite, resulting in a, in a big underestimation of the uh, amount of energy that comes off a of fire. And to the left there at 0.7 microns, you can see the potassium emission line, which is a very, very narrow atomic emission line. So again, my proposal is that measuring radiant emissions alone, we should be able to infer fire effects on organisms based on some sort of dose response, which might include some thermophysiological modeling. The classic dose response curve, it's a logistic curve it could have a threshold. We, we assume there is a threshold that uh, some amount of heat will not disturb an object. Uh, but the LD50 point is where 50% of the objects of the organisms die. And uh, again, uh, Alistair Smith showed uh, in a, in a long-term study that uh, as, a, as a function of radiant energy, there was uh, a a mortality on uh, seedlings that they, they obtained from uh, their uh, nursery out in the University of Idaho. And I think these experiments are still ongoing. They're, they're kind of uh, hard experiments, as are all experiments with living organisms. And of course, the response of any living organism is not the same as the next living organism, so there is some scatter in that. But in general, you, you expect to get a dose response curve for basically any effect on either an animal or a plant based on the dose, the dose here being how much heat was in the area of the organism. So back to radiation and convection. Just going to go over convection and radiation and the origins of these thermal transport methods for a few seconds. So convection implies the motion of a hot fluid. In a wildland fire, there's much heat energy, as we saw about 80%, is carried away by buoyancy-induced convective flows. The energy release causes heating of air and intended density drop, and that light fluid rises, causing convective flow. And anybody who's been on a wildfire, you can feel the flow towards the fire, if, if you have a big enough fire, and that eventually uh, goes uh, vertical and, and produces the column. And about 80% of the energy is via convection, as we've mentioned a few times. But we're still trying to understand what are the limits, the upper and lower limits of that 80% of energy transport. Is it, does it go down to 50%, up to 100%? What, and especially on larger fires, most of the experiments have been done on what I term laboratory scale or field scale fires, 
between a meter square and three or four meters square. So what, what happens when, uh, with this energy partition between convective and radiative transport as we go to bigger size fires? So we have a convection equation, basically it's Fourier's equation for heat transport, where the, the boundary layer is where the heat transport to the object occurs. And this is really complicated, but it can be measured. But what is the appropriate time and spatial scale? What about turbulence? And all our measurement devices to measure convective transport are relatively point measurements. That's why convection is, is a difficult thing to measure and why really radiation to me is the only way to really observe a fire at multiple scales. So radiation, I think most of you know, is the transfer of energy by electromagnetic radiation. It's described by Planck's distribution law. And the wavelength integrated form, which is assuming uh, gray absorbers and emitters, is that the, uh, the power from a fire, the power from a hot source is equal to the emissivity times a constant, the epsilon is emissivity, times a constant to, times t to the fourth. And t to the fourth dependence makes radiation the dominant transport mechanism above a few hundred degrees centigrade, for example, flames. Emissivity is reported in the literature, and we've done experiments at Rocky Mountain Research Station and uh, even at, at uh, my backyard. And it ranges from zero, which is a very thin flame, to nearly one for a very thick, opaque flame. And it could be near one for if you're staring at the ground surface through a thin flame, too. So that introduces some complexity as to what you're actually looking at. Again, radiation can be transported over infinite distances so that satellites, aircraft, drones, uh, instruments on poles all see radiation, perhaps at different sampling sizes, but they all see radiation. And using calorimeters and other radiometer type devices, including thermal cameras, which have been the, the, the vogue lately, uh, you can even take images of the radiation levels. And what we see here is because of the t to the fourth dependence, for example, 300 Kelvin roughly background, the red curve, is about a, uh, a thousand times less radiation than a fire would be at about 1300 Kelvins. So you have an extremely large dynamic range that must be accessed by our instruments to observe both a cold background and uh, a hot hot surface or a hot fire. And before I, before I uh, th there's a question here, can you give a layman's definition of black body radiation? That's a very good, uh, very good question for right now. And a black body, any, any object that's above absolute zero emits electromagnetic radiation due to the motion of the electrons in that object. Accelerating electrons emit radiation. And uh, that was first worked out by Planck. I call it Planck's radiation law. The, inter the wavelength integrated version of Planck's radiation law uh, is E equals the energy, the power equals uh, the couple of constants times T to the fourth. So in the past, radiation was thought to occur from heated soot, which are little particles of uh, carbon and large fuel particles, and that the radiation from the fire produced a black body spectrum. The black body spectrum is uh, the spectrum that's in this drawing uh, to the right of the screen there. We've measured this, and now this is a gross simplification of the radiant emission processes. The, the fire, the radiation from the fire is not black body necessarily, and especially in thick flames, has a lot of other components due to emission from hot, molecular emission from hot gases, atomic emission from things like potassium and sodium and phosphorus that are the components of every living thing. And assume, assumption of a black body spectrum when you're doing measurements of radiant energy will reduce an underestimate of the total energy from the fire. So let's look at a little bit more in detail. How does radiant energy get to our detector. In our case, in the case for most of the talks here, I'll be talking about overhead observation, 
such as would be obtained uh, from detectors that we've used uh, that are up on poles or from aircraft or satellites. We include the convective plume here because the convective plume does emit radiation in certain, in uh, many different types of radiation. So the first thing you have is direct radiation from the flame. Let's see if I can use my pointer here. So direct radiation from the flame is emission, and this may or may not be primarily black body radiation that comes from the hot flame and up, goes up to our detector. The flame also heats the soil. The soil can get quite hot, up to 800 centigrade we've seen in some of our experiments. And that 800 degree centigrade soil radiates quite strongly, and we can see that. So some of that SRR, soil re-radiated energy, heats the convective plume. The convective plume is warm by its, is hot by itself because it's, a, it's filled with combustion gases. And there's also radiation that's intercepted by the plume that heats the plume further. And then the plume re-radiates, and this could be molecular re-radiation in, in those bands that we saw a while ago, or it could be uh, just thermal radiation the plume can have also have carbon in it, unburned fuel, which can be heated by these multiple paths. So we really have a complex arrangement of uh, radiation sources from a wildland fire. But all these taken together can uh, are actually what reaches the detector, and they all add to what we think is the total energy released by the fire. So how does one go about measuring these radiant emissions? Remember, I'm primarily concerned with instrumentation in, in my head. <laughs> well, the problem is more complicated than an ear thermometer. And ear thermometers are exactly what we would use on a fire. They're radiometers. It's, just, it's a little device that measures uh, Radiant, dense, radiant energy density applied to it. And ear thermometers work in the 8 to 12 micron band using a thermopile. And the instrument works wonderfully and makes very precise measurements under a tenth of a degree for a $10 instrument because the inner ear emissivity, the emissivity is known and it's constant. It's about 0.92 for the inner, for the tympanium of the inner ear. So we only have, we, we measure this, and from that we can infer the temperature of the inner ear. So we only have one variable, and obviously it's easy to solve this. And, you know, these $10 instruments are pretty fabulous. So we've taken advantage of the development of these thermopile sensors to make our version of these instruments to measure wildland fires. So we're only, if you're only measuring one band, and here's an example, you can have some serious problems. Let's go back a few slides here. Remember we said that the emissivity for a flame can be something from, say, 0.05, to almost one. That varies by a couple of orders of magnitude, which means that the energy that you receive at your detector can vary by a couple of orders of magnitude. And the variation comes mostly in flame thickness. A thick flame has an emissivity near one. A thin flame has a low emissivity. So now we have two variables, but we only have one equation. And we can definitely get to a situation where if we say, look at the 8 to 12 band, and this is the band that your ear thermometer looks at, you can get, definitely get to a place where two different situations produce the same energy at the detector. So these two situations where we have a high emissivity and a low temperature and a low emissivity and a high temperature produce the same energy in that 8 to 12 band. We can't distinguish one from the other because we're only measuring the energy in a small band. So what do we do? We have two variables. 
We need another. We need another detector. Is what it winds up. So, a long time ago, uh, in the 20s, when people started to look at emission from black bodies, they realized that using two detectors with two different sensitive band passes, you could measure the temperature because of the T to the fourth, or, or there's a, the relationship between T and the power that comes off within each individual band. So this is a, the Stefan Boltzmann equation. Well, if you integrate this over the, the transmission window of the detector, you can find out that the ratio between, let's say, two different bands is a function of temperature alone. And this allows us to measure the inferred temperature or the equivalent black body temperature of the fire, and from that determine the true energy radiated by the fire. So you can imagine if I measured the energy here and here, the ratio of those two would be wildly different for this low temperature, high emissivity, and this high temperature, low emissivity situation. So for years, we've used simple two-band detectors to measure the radiant flux from a fire. And this is one that we call a pocket radiometer. I think there's, there's 50 of these wandering around the country in different people's hands. We have wide band passes on the detectors, and they give a large signal and simple calibration and analysis of the data. The arrow points to the thermal pile detector. It's just a little can about a centimeter in diameter has two holes there, as you can see, which are the windows for the two different sensitive bands where the radiation passes through and is detected uh, and amplified and sent to this, to this data logger. And this is the kind of data we get. Uh, this is a fire in New Jersey, and uh, we, we can measure the flux density from the fire in watts per meter squared. And we can also infer a temperature because of this function, which shows that the uh, ratio is just a function of temperature. So we can measure a temperature and also a total power that's radiated by the fire. And if we integrate this curve, we get that over time, this is time on this axis, we get the total energy liberated by the fire. So we're going to use multiple bands. We've done that for years. But it turns out this is not enough either. How do you choose which bands and why? Remember a while back we talked about anomalous black, non-black body emission from the hot fire gases. If you choose the wrong bands, you're going to miss that energy and underestimate the fire output. If you include these bands, and if these are wide bands, say, uh, and these emission bands, are, I, I might add, are in the 2 to 5 micron range, you might get erroneously high inferred temperatures and overestimate the uh, emission from the fire. So you have the condition where you might underestimate and overestimate, which kind of makes your instrument uh, suspect. And we've seen these conditions where we have a fire and we're getting the temperatures are way higher than what you'd get from the normal uh, diffusion-limited flame temperatures, which are about 1,200 centigrade. And we believe that's because we're also seeing in our previous detectors, for example, this pocket radiometer, these are, very, these are wide bandwidths. The detectors have wide bandwidths, and we're seeing in the mid-wave or the shorter wave band uh, the short wave detector, we're seeing large amounts of emitted radiation from hot gases. Now, the satellite guys look at the atmosphere transmission, and there's, there's a lot of places where the atmosphere is totally absorbing. So they're obviously not going to put their observation windows when the atmosphere absorbs 100 percent. They're not going to get any light through. So they, they typically put 
for example, the modus, one of the modus bands that's used for fire detection is 10 point, is, is uh, this band right here, about 10.9 microns. The other one is about four microns over here someplace. So those two bands are used by the satellite guys because these, this color of light, this wavelength of light will get through the atmosphere. What about that carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and water vapor emission? They're going to miss that totally. So we have to pick the right bands. But we also have to have enough dynamic range, that is the smallest signal to the largest signal in the electronics and the sensor to cover cold to deep flame, full field of view observations. Now our available detectors have a large dynamic range of about a million, but the required electronics was not available at an affordable price, so we had to build our own. So we designed a multi-band system. Presently we have five bands with a wide dynamic range data acquisition system. So the present measurements that we've been making for quite a few years with two, two relatively wide band detectors have poor spectral fidelity and don't allow us to determine if there's lots of emission from carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and other hot combustion products and, heat, and heated air. So we've selected some narrower filter pass bands outside the molecular absorption emission bands and additionally still use the two wide bands. And also, we were able to, to make a, de a radiation detector that has an extremely light, high bandwidth using a, a new type of window that we're able to get, uh, a new type of filter window in front of our detector. And uh, I'll, I'll ex explain that in a, in a few minutes. So if you look in the mid-wave, sort of a three to five micron band, Cold background and a fire have a, a difference in signal of about 20,000. So this is obviously not adequate for a detector with 10 or 12 bits of resolution. We need uh, a lot higher resolution, and we weren't able to buy any, any uh, data loggers to do these kind of measurements. And again, the native dynamic range of the thermal pile is about a million. So by restricting our electronics to 10 or 12 or even 14 bits of resolution, we're really limiting our, de our detectors. And uh, really, for, we, we were not able to see cold background or anything resembling cold background or the cool down after the fire of the soil. And that's a lot of interest for soil and uh, post-fire uh, fire effects. So these are just, for example, the emission bands of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons emit very strongly, too. There's a lot of unburned fuel. Uh, 3.875 is sort of a magic band. There's really nothing in that band. So that's, that is what we, you can use that as a reference band. So, so uh, our five-band detector now uses two narrow bands that are chosen to be the same as the MODIS bands, because we want to see what is MODIS C compared to what is the total energy released by the fire using their fire algorithm uh, mod 14. And we do that with a very wide band detector as a check on the total energy released. So our current detectors, we have the uh, detector that we've used for a long time, two wide bands. We have two narrow bands which line up with the MODIS satellite bands. And we have a very wide band detector that basically detects all the radiation from the fire. This is just uh, showing that we need more resolution, which we've built into the electronics. So these are our particular bands, which I've mentioned already. So we built custom electronics to integrate these thermopile sensors to data loggers. We need each, each thermopile needs amplifiers, ways to calibrate the detector, uh, analog to digital converters, real-time clocks, radio telemetry if that's needed. And we assemble these components and write software for so-called computer-on modules. And the device we're using now is called an Arduino. It's really a hobbyist 
tool that I can get my students to program very easily. And we have ways to calibrate both the radiometry and also other uh, type of measurements that we make that we can hook up to these data loggers. An example of what this thing looks like, a little metal box. And you can see here, there's the five band five bands. We have two holes, two holes, and one hole. That's two, three, four, five. This is a very wide band detector. And we have a, two detectors, one of which is two wider bands, and one of which is the two modus bands. We've made about 35 of these, and uh, we're currently collecting data with this and trying to figure out how to understand the data. That's our custom circuit board. Again, we have 24-bit resolution. Up to 16 channels of infrared data can be recorded. Currently, we have five. We have 12 10-bit channels, real-time clock, other stuff that's necessary to make a nice electronics acquisition package. This is an example of what you get from the wideband detector, which is very curious. So this is a very low-intensity fire in Longleaf Pine at the Tall Timbers Research Station from uh, last year. And we have our fire passage. And afterwards, that's, I, I'm pretty sure that's boil off of water from the surface, which holds the surface at about 100 degrees centigrade for quite a, quite a long time. These are two-second step intervals. So we have about 150, about 300 seconds, about five minutes of water boiling off the surface. That's the first time we've observed this. And it's just uh, it's exciting to have this kind of dynamic range and be able to see relatively cold background and how long it takes to, for the soil to return to basically ambient temperatures. I'm going to end with just a few photographs of these instruments deployed in the field. This is a setup where we have both a infrared camera, infrared visible camera system, and also our 24-bit radiometer package on the same, observing the same uh, field of view. So I'll open it up for discussion, and uh, thank you for your attention. And I wish to thank all my collaborators. I'm going to go back to the beginning here somehow. Over the years, who've been supportive of my work, and just the best bunch of folks available. <laughs> I guess there's no re no way to go about this quickly. Is there? You can oh, there you is. can use the drop down. There we go. Oh yeah. Well, right. never mind. All right. <laughs> Great. I wish to, you know, Chris Tompkins has been, a, he was a student here and he's now a, a PhD student at Harvard and works at the Broad Institute. Uh, Nick Skronsky, Matt Dickinson, Joe O'Brien, Colin Hardy, Mark Finney from the Forest Service, Wilfred Schroeder and Evan from uh, NOAA and University of Maryland, Mike Balkowski and Alistair, all have been great collaborators and supporters over the years. Uh, and uh, without them, this work couldn't be possible. So I'll open up the floor to any questions and, uh, Thanks for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. Um, so if folks have questions, you can type into the chat box. Um, I have one sort of going, I think it's on your second slide, going back to uh, Lord Kelvin, um, where, uh, you, where you said, when you can measure what you were speaking about and express it in numbers, you know something about it. So now that you've got these precision measurements or you're, you, you've made progress toward these precision measurements, what can you tell us about wildfire or about prescribed fire from what you've seen in the field while you're testing these measurements or these instruments? Well, we don't really get much chance to operate in the wildfire environment, but we certainly operate over a fairly wide range of fire behaviors in a uh, uh, prescribed fire environment. You know, in New Jersey, uh, the folks down there are, are pretty happy to get a head fire going and uh, get some, get some uh, propagating crown <laughs> fire, uh, pretty scary. But they, they they will do that down there, so you know that that's that's why you need these wide dynamic ranges. Uh, you know, a, a large crown fire generates 150 kilowatts per meter squared, and your average little dinky prescribed fire and leaf litter is five or six kilowatts per meter squared. So right right there, you have a huge variation in intensities, and um, and fire effects, of course, and everything that's related to that. Uh, and again, we, we want to know what happens after the passage of the fire, how the ground cools down, what's going on. 
and you know, see, seeing that water liberated was really interesting. So what have we learned? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I'm just an instrumentation guy. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still, still learning. This is part of a multi-year project, of course, too. But Forever. It's a forever yeah. project. So I think with this crowd, I'm actually going to unmute the phone lines. I'm going to do that right now. So if you're out there and you have a question, uh, please um, please speak up. And if you're not asking a question, please try to mute your phone line. And if you have a question, please close it to Bob. Uh-oh. Everybody's asleep. I don't think they're asleep. I think they're just being shy. Well, Matt Dickinson has a question. He's always got a question. Hey, Amanda. Hey, what up? This is Mark Taylor. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. I'll, uh, you know, being a bureaucrat with shrinking budgets, I'll just throw this out there. Where where are we going where this can replace, like, plot work and save us money in the long run with fire effects monitoring? Or will we ever get there? Yeah, Bob, what can you do to answer Mark's question? You know, one of the things well, I, up in the uh, conference in Maine, I, I talked about, you know, once we understand this enough, the ability to make an instrument that maybe is a $20 instrument that you can nail to a tree as you walk through the woods before your prescribed fire and really have an idea of what the fire intensities were to give you a, along with a, a mortality model, to give you a, uh, idea of what your effects were going to be from your prescribed fire in advance, you know, right at the minute that the fire ends. Um, so that, that's the long-term goal, and uh, that I think that's a lofty goal. So. <laughs> Great, thank you. Do you have other questions out there? Bob, this is this is Ken Clark, and I have a, a question about the the emission spectra from potassium, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and water vapor. Are those correctable? I mean, it it seems like you know a lot of the modus streams and things. I mean, there's a lot of algorithms to correct various things. Um, is that possible to to correct? Well, you you can't correct for things that don't get through the atmosphere. You can't yeah, observe, true. you know, from from even uh, air, aircraft observations, you have uh, the lower atmosphere absorbs most of the carbon dioxide and, and, and the water vapor, especially the hot water vapor, you don't see anything. So you really don't know. Yeah. So what, you, what you can hopefully do is come up with, uh, if, if you can see a fire and you might need to know what the conditions were during the burning, you know, is it a wet day? When, when the fire happened, I mean, it's not usually a wet day, but is it wetter? What's the fuel moisture? You know, can you get, take a guess of that and, and correct um, correct your modus measurements? Uh, Wilfred Schroeder and Evan uh, El Elcott uh, are modus guys, They're, and uh, they, they prompted a lot, some of this research uh, into looking at the modus bands and figuring out what they're missing. I mean, even though they work on modus, uh, I don't think they trust it. <laughs> yeah. I know they don't trust it. <laughs> Great, thank you. I think we have time for another question. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, so here's, this is Matt Dickinson. So um, how would you use the, the data, the ground data to um, to help design and maybe uh, correct measurements from from space. How, how would you design space uh, sensors that that really do what we need to do for wildland fire? Well, I think you know if you capture enough data near ground, you know, like using those uh, pole things that we stick in the ground that I showed a few examples of, you can at least put a, a range on um, on what you're measuring. So if you you know, because right now we don't we have some numbers, but we don't really have accuracy estimates on these numbers. 
or ranges. So, and that doesn't make the data useless. It just makes the data has error bars, and right now the error bars are totally unknown. So is it a factor of two? Is it 10%? You know, what is the satellite missing? And right now there's, there's absolutely no estimates on, on that. Uh, so I think the, the idea is if we make enough measurements and we understand, and it's going to vary from fire to fire, how much energy is in those uh, molecular emission bands, we'll understand the error bounds on a remotely observed signal that's just, let's say, in those two modus bands. Did I answer the question or maybe not? <laughs> yeah, what, so what about, I mean, if, if you had some input into the next satellite sensor that goes up, what, what would its characteristics be? Well, I, th I think they've done well. Um, you know, certainly an another issue, of course, and uh, David Roy and his student uh, out at the University of South Dakota, we wrote a paper a bunch of years ago about, you know, we, right now we, we look four times a day. Well, <laughs> let's face it, four times a day is not often enough to observe a wildland fire. So you can make estimates of how much you've missed. But I think, you know, higher resolution is important, spatial resolution. Staring is important. And the, the new GOES satellite is very exciting because it, the data comes back every five minutes. Uh, so you really are staring at the, situ at the surface. Uh, as far as the bands, you know, the, band, the, the atmosphere is still going to obscure carbon dioxide and, and, and water vapor, so I don't think you can do much better than they're doing now. All right. My clock now says it's uh, 1 after 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. Um, I think I'm going to cut it off there. Um, if anyone has questions, please feel free to reach out to, to Bob um, or let me know if you need his contact info. Um, again, Bob, thank you so much for presenting, and thanks, everybody, so much for joining us today. I hope you all have a lovely day, and uh, we'll see you in another two weeks uh, with Dr. Ken Clark at our next uh, CERTIC series as part of the North Atlantic Fire Science Exchange uh, webinar series. So thanks again, everybody, and have a great day. Hey, thank you.